First Peter chapter one. We're going to begin reading verse thirteen uh, through verse nineteen um, tonight. America has a new speaker of the house. Is, uh, who, this is a top guy in, on the, the house side of uh, Congress. And his name is Mike Johnson. He's from Louisiana. And he made the statement after uh, taking over that position that, he, you know, I was kind of surprised to say this, but he said that if you want to know what I believe, read your Bible. Amen. And he began to talk about, uh, uh, you know, having a Bible worldview. And I'm thinking, wow, how'd this guy get in in D.C.? You know? <laughs> Um, uh, there's some interesting days ahead here, um, but uh, you know, obviously, I was uh, I was uh, excited to hear somebody in that position of power Amen. make those kind of statements. But what he said is very important, and, and uh, which is that when you believe something, you have a certain view of life, or you have a certain view of the world, and it affects how you think and how your mind works. You know, repentance really means what? Many of you know this. It means having a change of mind. It starts there. It obviously is going to include a, 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 a life choices that you make about how you're going to live. But it starts in having a new thought. And that thought is to agree with God and to change your mind about how you're living. And so we can... Uh, understand tonight that the mind is a very important thing to God. In fact, it's, it, we don't even, the human beings don't even understand the mind. Scientists uh, make advancements in all kinds of ways, but the mind is a mystery. Oh, they can take out a brain and look at it and, and, and draw these rough conclusions about things, but the mind of a person, that's God's area. And so I want to talk about this because the scripture talks about uh, having a renewed mind. You know, Christians think a certain way. That's why some people who don't know God or maybe have a little religion, and now that you got born again, they accuse you what? Of being brainwashed. You know? Uh, why? How can you live the way you're living? You didn't used to do that. I know. I changed my mind. I repented. Uh, and now I see things differently. I have a renewed mind. So let's look at First Peter chapter 1. I won't hold you long, but I want to touch this uh, thought tonight. Verse 13 says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, so also be holy in your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you tonight for being in this place, for your word to have access into our hearts. I pray, God, for a revelation into, into every mind, God, that we'd understand the battleground that is the mind, and we understand the victory that is there as we obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, let's talk about this subject for a little bit. Because God's word and God's will is established uh, by our thoughts. Your thoughts are very important to God. And they determine so much of the direction of your life. And Jesus says, uh, the great commandment is what? You shall love the Lord your God with all of your soul, with all of your heart, and with all of your mind. And so... Um, how do you love God with your mind? How do you do that? And so the challenge is to love God, not just with your heart, as it were, even your emotions, but to love Him with your mind. 
Romans 8 says, to be carnally minded though is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There is a way of thinking that leads to spiritual death. To be carnally minded. What is carnally minded? That's just a natural mind that has not been renewed by God's spirit and God's word and thinks all kinds of foolishness. Paul told the Galatians in chapter 4 uh, that we henceforth do not walk as the Gentiles walk uh, in the vanity of their own minds. And how many understand tonight that uh, when you don't know God, a lot of your thoughts are not true and they're not right. They're based on maybe limited information. They're based on a limited understanding, certainly no revelation of who God is. Uh, and so it's impossible then, therefore, to come to any kind of right conclusions. And that's why the challenge of Christians, don't be carnally minded, but be spiritually minded. Love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know, God wants our heads to be in the game. I say this about some little kids, man, they're only two or three, and their head's already in the game. You know what I mean? Some, you don't know, they're just bumping into stuff. But uh, others, man, they're already picking up stuff. They're already, you can see it in their eye, they're, they're already, you know. They're already in the game. Well, God wants your mind to be in the game. He wants you to be a spiritually minded person. So you're considering spiritual reality. You're not, as they say, lost in the sauce. You're not just somebody just kind of numbly going through life, but your mind is active and it's at work. That's why he's that's what he's talking about. Gird up the loins of your mind. You know, what does that even mean? Well, uh, you know, it, it, it demands a little bit of uh, interpretation. Uh, but girding up your loins uh, in the days of the Bible was to, you know, be ready for some kind of action. If you were going to run, you'd have to tie up your, you know, rope. They didn't have, you didn't have Nike's latest stuff. Uh, what you had was what everybody else had a rope. Uh, but they learned that they had to tie it up a certain way. If you're getting re ready to fight, you know. Maybe you're one of those guys that need to take your shirt off, you know, <laughs> you're getting ready. That's kind of the idea. You're sort of girding up your, you know, but he's saying that's the way your mind needs to be. Oh, yeah. Gird up your mind. Uh, what is he talking about? He said, get your mind ready for action. Oh, you know, I mean, nobody has to have a dull mind. Or you have your coffee. Oh. <laughs> yeah, do not talk to me before I have my coffee in the morning. Amen. I try sometimes, and she's learned. But uh, it doesn't register a lot yet. You know, uh, you, what are you addicted to caffeine? You can talk to me after service. <laughs> but in the mornings, anyway, I, I'm getting off base here. Let me, let me get a disciplined mind right, right now. But there's been real concern that people today have very undisciplined minds. Back in th actually 35 years ago. A uh, professor by the name of Alan Bloom, who'd been a college professor for years, and he loved college students. Man, they they had questions. Uh, there's something about a young person. They're curious. And they want to learn. They have questions, and the world, man, is just wide open to them. And he loved being a teacher. But he said, "I began to notice something about the students." This is the back in the late '80s. He said, I began to notice something about the students. Uh, they didn't have that uh, active mind anymore. They seemed like they already had their minds made up. Uh, they were totally coming to me already indoctrinated. Uh, and they weren't even thinking rationally. They were basing one, most of their decisions uh, on their emotions and on their feelings, uh, especially when you're talking about moral issues. And he wrote a book that blew the lid off the intellectual shallow, shallowness uh, of the 80s, uh, and he called it the, the uh, closing of the American mind. I remember when this book came out, uh, it, it was like it, it came with a, with a uh, you know, a, with great intellectual force and a lot of debate about it and so forth, but I'm going to tell you, now 35 years down the road, man, uh, you can see the, the effects, man. A college campus is not a place to go anymore to get wisdom and knowledge. In fact, those same kids that he was complaining about are now the professors with closed minds and, and the lack of rational thought. And I don't have time to go into all of that, but let's just say that, that there's not a whole lot of uh, uh, um, uh, thinking today that's uh, what you would call rational or critical thinking. 
You know, critical thinking is the ability to have an active mind to see something and ask the right questions uh, and to pursue something uh, that's going to lead you to the right answer. Young people today, they tell us, and you know, not to get off on a tangent on this stuff, but it does prove something that's going on. A lot of people aren't thinking anymore. They just don't think they're just. You know, to read a book, you have to kind of think, right? Come on. Right? I mean, yeah. your, your brain has to work. No, no, I'll wait for the video. You know, <laughs> uh, come on. Uh, that's not even interesting. Give me another one. But a book, you have to, you, your mind has to work. Come on. And they say, and I don't know if these are true, but I hope they're 60% of adults. 60% of adults have never read a book of any kind. Oh, Not Christian, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Bible, that's a book. If you really read it, you're doing fine. Only 6% read one book a year. And I wonder how many movies those same 6% are watched of in one year. They say only 40 one percent of teenagers can name the three branches of government in America. Ooh. Four out of ten can name the three branches of government. Very quickly, what are the three? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> 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 I got to do with living for Jesus, Pastor. I don't know. <laughs> but sixty percent can name the three stooges of probably the three Kardashian sisters. Well. Modern American, the modern American Christian, they say, has Christian ethics and even some Christian habits, but listen, no longer a Christian mind. So the Bible talks about preparing your mind for action. It has to do with thinking clearly and intelligently or having a disciplined mind or, or to tighten up your thinking. Um, you know, the idea here again is that your your uh, your, your your mind is sober and your mind is clear and it's and it's aware of what you're involved with uh, involved in. Somebody called it uh, rolling up the sleeves and putting your mind in gear. Putting your mind in gear. Uh, let me just say that this is one of the main benefits of prayer. Is that you're renewing your mind as you really pray, as you consider the Word of God and the things of God and the will of God and what He has for your life and how your life's going to make a difference and the needs of people that you're concerned about. It's getting your mind in action and you're getting a renewed mind. And that renewed mind is going to keep you on, on, on the path that God wants you to be on as a Christian. God is going to have your heart. He must first have your mind. You know, AI, artificial intelligence, is, is making leaps and bounds of, of progress now. And, um, it's, it's unbelievable how fast AI is beginning to kind of take over so many things. And You know, you don't know what to believe. You hear a lot of different stuff, but uh, some people say that you're not going to need uh, uh, even actors anymore. AI is going to is going to is going to you know frame uh, make movies on its own. You're not even need actors. You're going to have fake people that look like real people. Uh, they're going to film it, and and you're not going to need screenwriters. And that's just one area. And then authors and all of man, even all of the arts that AI is taking over. But I'm thinking, you know. Um, does, can AI, can it be renewed by the Holy Ghost? Come on. No, just computer, it's just computer. Is it going to be able to fathom God and worship God? No, but your mind can. You were created in God's image. You're not a robot. You're not, you're not just a, a technology, uh, um, you know, and, and uh, you, your mind is, is completely way, way more advanced than even the most advanced AI. Yeah, maybe faster calculating all kinds of stuff uh, than you and I could ever dream of, uh, but it can never know God, but you can. Amen. So if God is going to have our hearts, we must first have our mind. Each thought that we have, carries with it a little spiritual power, a tug for or away from God. 
every thought that we have contains in it a little spiritual power that either pulls you away from God or pulls you towards God. Come on, come on. That's why the, the Word of God is concerned about our minds and our thoughts. Each thought that we have does this. No thought is purely neutral. Each thought is to some degree God breathed or God avoided. And it's either leading to spiritual life or spiritual death. People don't backslide because they're thinking the right thoughts. How do you know that? People don't turn from God or turn from faith or, or, or uh, become subsumed under their, under their problems uh, because they were thinking the, right, the, the wrong thoughts. Uh, I mean, speak, uh, thinking the right thoughts. They were thinking the wrong thoughts. They weren't having a renewed mind. They were thinking thoughts uh, that were beginning to take them away from God uh, and sometimes even open up their hearts to sin. That's why there's no such thing. As a neutral thought. So a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a destiny. The Greek word is noema. And it means to, it, it, to have your thoughts. And so this is where the enemy can get involved. The devil wants to dominate your mind. What we see happening in our world, and I talked about what's happening among young people, uh, and, and there's no critical thinking anymore, they're dominated. It's an indoctrination. They're, they're as, as if they're under this heavy oppression. Some people have called it a psyop. People have been uh, indoctrinated even from a young age, and, and, and they, they, they don't have even the ability to, to make sense in the haze of life. They draw the wrong conclusions about everything. Peter says later in the same book that we're looking at, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The answer to the devil and his, his uh, seeking to devour you is to be sober and to be vigilant. Amen. Those are both words that speak of the right kind of mind. You certainly want to be sober. You want to be clear-minded. You want to, you know, think the right thoughts. 1 Thessalonians verse 5 says, Let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and let us be sober. Amen. And so the devil's always trying to infiltrate your thoughts. Ephesians 6 says, he calls it the fiery darts of the wicked one. Amen. You know, we, don't, we see fiery darts, we're thinking, I've never seen that. But actually what he's, what, what he's uh, referring to is the first century. Maybe you've seen the old Roman movies where they're shooting these arrows and they have fire and they start fires wherever they landed. That's, what he, that's the word image that he's using here when he's talking about uh, uh, you know, uh, having the shield of faith. That we're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Uh, because as those thoughts come into your mind, uh, trying to start a fire. Come on. The devil's trying to start something that's going to spread and change the way you think and change the way you live. But, but taking the shield of faith that be able to quench all the fiery darts. And I'm going to tell you tonight that the, that, uh, 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 that uh, um, shield is going to be the word of God. It's going to be the thoughts of God. Peter also says it like this. As Christ suffered in the flesh, so arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his time to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Part of living, being a Christian is there going to be times when your flesh is suffering. Now, when you have scriptures like mortify your flesh, uh, yeah, that's called suffering. That means your flesh doesn't get to do what it wants. We're just screaming and crying. Oh my God, I'm suffering. No, you're just not getting your way. That's <laughs> but there are times, man, when, you know, you, 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 there is some real suffering. Christ suffered in the flesh. He says, so you, you arm yourselves with the same mind. Put your mind in the right place. There is times that, that's going to be trials. There are times that are going to be difficult. Uh, but, you know, don't be dismayed by it. But, but uh, uh, steal yourself in that situation. Have the right mind and right thoughts. Amen. What damages Christians, all of us, 
is being passive and unmotivated and um, not not being disciplined in our minds. Right. These are these are these are times when we won't pray, we won't read our Bible, we won't consider the things of God. Come on. It's so easy. I've been talking about sowing to your flesh in, 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 in different ways, but it's so easy just to kind of put your mind on just cruise control. I mean, come on. You know, I, you know, I, I heard about TikTok. <laughs> I don't have the app on my phone, but I, it, it started putting them on YouTube. I find a lot of good videos on YouTube, so. And so, you know, I saw these short videos, you know, and um, I never been, and I heard about TikTok, but I didn't really know what it was. I knew it was something like, you know, and the thing is mesmerizing, man. I started looking at it and go, oh, that's interesting. And, you know, he lasted about 45 seconds. And then another one came up, and you got to just keep flicking. After a while, they go, I'm turning into a guinea pig. <laughs> And most of them are interested, but if you don't like it, if it's stupid or something, you just you just go right past it. Before you know it, man, you're just in a trance. So. Come on. Not that you could have been doing anything else with that whole hour of time. So you be leaving the door open. The enemy to the us. Come on. Fall into the trap of immorality or unbelief or bitterness. Um, where did it all begin? Right here. The message translation says it like this. Don't lazily slip back in the old grooves of evil doing just what you feel like doing. Old grooves evil doing, just doing what you feel like doing, for we know that those old grooves still exist. Anybody found that out? That you have old grooves in your mind that are still there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You, know, you know what a record is? Some of you other people uh -huh. know. It had grooves in it, and you put the needle on the groove, and that's what played the music somehow came out of it. I don't know how, I still don't, but they had grooves, and it just, you could play the sit. Every time you put the needle on there, it's going to play the same exact thing. And, well, your mind has those grooves. You return to those same thoughts. By the way, this is why it's so important to have a renewed mind. This is why it's so important to, of the blood of Jesus and the Word of God because uh, those grooves are real. It doesn't matter if it happened to you when you were nine years old, man. You could be 70 today. There's grooves on that thing that happened. Let me move on quickly. I'll bring this to a close. It's also talking about a mind that comprehends things. Paul said in something interesting in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, when I was a child, I thought like a child. But now that I've become a man, I put away childish things. And so I think differently. A man ought not to be thinking like a child. One of the problems of our generation is you have lots of men that are thinking like children. Maybe not eight-year-old children, but let's say 18-year-old children when they're 44 years old. And so the, the idea behind this is that you need to be able to comprehend more and more spiritual reality and spiritual truth. Paul had to rebuke the Corinthians. He says, uh, you know, I couldn't come to you as, uh, as a, a, a spiritually mature or adults uh, because you still are acting like children spiritually. And so there's a comprehending mind that grabs hold of truth. And Paul was addressing something very important. And by the way, if you know when he said that, he said that in the context of love. There's a whole chapter on love. And that's when he starts to talk about uh, being mature. Because the Christian maturity and love are the same thing. And so there's a lost art of a comprehending mind. God wants you to comprehend more and more, which is understand. That's why as you age in life and as you age in the faith, your understanding should be higher. Come on. You shouldn't still be locked into something. Some Christians have been around church for 20 years, but they still have a mind like they've only been there a year. 
Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Right. Verse 18 says, knowing, you'll see that prominently in the New Testament epistles. John uses this often, that, that word knowing. It's good to know things. That means you understand, you comprehend. And you comprehend to, to the level that it's changing your life and changing your course. Mark. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, uh, but with the precious blood of Christ. Uh, that's an understanding. That's a comprehension. That's a, that's a revelation, if you will, uh, that our salvation wasn't just something that's just kind of been handed through us through tradition, but if you're really saved, it took the blood of Jesus. Come on. Amen. And you're comprehending something very valuable. Very quickly, why don't you turn to Ephesians 4. I'm almost done. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Praise God. In between Galatians and Philippians. Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, 
whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Yeah. What do you meditate on? I'm just well, no, I'm, I'm, mind's in a gutter. My mind's in, my mind is just a, in a bad place. Really? You're just you're just staying right there, aren't you? Why don't you pay attention to the word of God? You know, the, the prior verse says, don't worry about anything, but in everything about prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then he says, uh, this is what you need, this is what you need to do and how you're living your life. Think the thoughts that God wants you to think. Casting down imaginations. There's so many verses about the, this reality. Casting down ima uh, imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Yes, yes. And have a readiness to avenge all disobedience, the Bible says. That has to do with your thoughts. Amen. Anything that comes up against the, the Word of God and against the revelation of God, anything unclean that, that's seeking to take that place in your life, cast it down. Come on. Throw it down. Come on. And elevate the Word of God. Amen. 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 Amen.